Thank you very much. Great to see you, Dima. And be back here at Penn State, have this chance to talk about the recent advances on triple and quadruple soap bubbles. Yeah, good to see you. So the it all starts, the story starts with a single bubble, single bubble, which is round. And that's the least area way to enclose the given volume of air, as was proved mathematically by Schwartz back in 1884. But similarly, clusters of bubbles look for the least area way to enclose and separate several regions of prescribed volume. So here's a, I want to start out with a question for you. Do soap bubble clusters find the absolute least area shape? Choices, I'm going to go with yes, not all, yes, always. No, not always. See, no one knows for sure, which is usually the answer in mathematics. But here the answer is B, no, not always, as exhibited by these two five bubble clusters, same five volumes. The only difference is where the tiny fifth volume is placed. On the left there, it's placed among the larger bubbles, and on the right, it's placed among medium-sized smaller bubbles, with the result that the cluster on the right has a bit more area than the one on the left, and is an example of a soap bubble cluster that fails to find the absolute least area shape, although it's perfectly stable. Is the one on the left the best? No, it's better to put that tiny fifth region in back with the three absolutely largest bubbles. And then is that the best? Well, I think so, but it's hard to know for sure. How do you ever know that there might not be something better? This is the hard part in this business. In fact, for a long time, my favorite open question was whether the standard triple bubble that you see all the time is the least area way to enclose and separate those three given volumes of air. Until, finally, we realized that we didn't even know if the double bubble was the least area way to enclose and separate two given volumes of air. Uh, we mathematicians thought we knew this as a fact. We asked this poor undergraduate, Joel Foisy, to write up the proof as part of his undergraduate thesis. But when we talked to the mathematicians around the world who knew how to prove it, it turned out they didn't. And so I, I asked Joel what it was like to see this what first appeared as a conjecture in his undergraduate thesis attract so much attention and work by mathematicians around the world. And this is what Joel said to me. I threw the double bubble conjecture appeared in my thesis. Um, and then I started hearing reports about how progress was going. It was exciting to hear that people were making progress on it. And I was, I was happy. A small part of me was a little bit um, envious isn't the right way of word, wistful of, you know, wanting to participate and be part of that. Of course, he was an important part of it right from the beginning. And he's since had his own groups of undergraduate students working on new projects with him at SUNY Potsdam. Well, this is a beautiful shape. What else, what, what could beat it? Two separate bubbles are wasteful, right? Because when they come together, they can share that common wall that's more efficient. High school students often suggest another idea. How about a bubble inside a bubble? But that's even worse, because if the little bubble comes out, the outside bubble gets smaller. And then when they come together, it does still better. Yeah, hard to think of other possibilities. But there are others better than this bubble inside a bubble. Look, I got it one time there in, in China at, at Shanghai University, uh, but it doesn't last too long. As soon as it comes down and touches the outer bubble, it, it, it pops out, disappears. But there are other possibilities. And now I'm gonna show you a picture of a very strange non-standard double bubble. This is a computer simulation by John Sullivan. You ready for this? So there's one bubble on the inside, with another toroidal bubble wrapped around it. And this is unstable and has more area than the standard double bubble. So it doesn't disprove the conjecture, but it does make you realize that there may be other possibilities that neither we nor the bubbles have thought of yet. Here's a better picture where you can see how narrowly the waste gets squeezed by that inner tube bubble around it. And, and you know, if that could happen, Maybe the blue bubble at the center with the red inner tube around it could have a second component, a skinnier 
blue inner tube around the red inner tube around the central blue bubble. Connected, if you like, by some thread of negligible area. So there's really no way in these in this problem to insist that the uh, to say anything about whether the regions are are connected connected or not. No way to prevent two separate components. And if that can happen, maybe you could have layers of tori on tori on tori. Or maybe the two bubbles could be knotted around each other somehow. Or maybe, maybe the bubbles would be totally fragmented, broken into millions of pieces. Maybe even with some empty space on the inside. Crazy idea. So this is kind of the low point of the talk. Everything looks hopeless at this stage. And it took us about eight years until we had a proof that the standard double bubble was better than any of these crazy alternatives. And one of my co-authors in this was one of my former undergraduate research students, Michael Hutchings, who's now professor of mathematics at Cal Berkeley. I wanna say just a word about the proof. The starting proposition is that the minimizer has to be a surface of revolution. So there's a kind of symmetry argument. And Hutchings deduced that therefore the bubble has to be just layers of tori on tori on tori, which you can get by rotating this picture around the axis of symmetry. And he generalized the argument to get component bounds and was able to show that there are just two or three components. So the solution's got to look something like one of these two pictures here, although the inner tubes could be much less symmetric, maybe quite lopsided. And then the final step is to show that all of these other possibilities are unstable. You have to actually find the instabilities, find the way to vary them to get negative second variation. But that was uh, the difficult part. Um, I remember there were six difficult cases. Each one, you had to find these, these instabilities. Well, that was the completion of the proof, but right on the heels of our work, my undergraduate research students generalized the result to four-dimensional space, where it turns out the component bounds are weaker. So that although you still know that one of the bubbles, the yellow one here, has just one component, there's the, the other bubble could have many, many components, the blue one. So there could be many of these second level tori encircling the yellow bubble encircling the, the center blue bubble. That's how I, remember, I think there were over a hundred uh, cases that, that they had to deal with. So here's what Ben had to say about that. Eliminate them individually in small groups to leave just two or three unresolved problem cases. But instead of finishing the proof off, the next week I got more ambitious and tried to classify general cases in higher dimensions. I eventually found a single case in R5 which could not be eliminated by our methods. So we'd run into a wall in a situation where both regions were disconnected. Most of the rest of the work was on trying to understand the R4 results from the general perspective instead of just on a case by case basis. We started by focusing on small pieces of, of the bubble. Leaves. Well, as he mentioned there, they got stuck in R5, and there was just there a lopsided, a bubble that was so lopsided that the methods didn't apply. And so that was seemed like a dead end for many years. Uh, in 2005, a graduate student, Marilyn Daly, managed to eliminate this particular case, but was very disappointed that her method failed to eliminate many other similar cases. And she gave she she gave up on that and math, I think, sadly. But Ben stayed with it, and in 2008 had a proof of in general dimensions without using any component bounds. So he actually found instabilities for these multi-level tori on tori on tori around the central bubble, no matter how intricate and complicated. It was a real tour de force, which no one's ever extended to other spaces. So for example, the double bubble conjecture remains open in hyperbolic space today in dimensions three and above. Okay, now, if you wanna read more about it, you can find more of the account in my geometric measure theory book. 
but we're ready to turn back to the triple bubble because there were over the past few years, some hints of progress, but to find them, you have to leave Euclidean space and go to a nicer space to work in. You know, there is one space that's much nicer than Euclidean space. I'm not thinking of the sphere, no. It's Gauss space, that is Rm, but with Gaussian density, which uh, goes like e to the minus r squared over two with respect to the distance r from the origin. So it drops off, the density drops off exponentially. It's concentrated around the origin and then drops off very rapidly. Lots of applications in probability theory for this, Brownian motion, stock option pricing. Um, it and the isoparametric consequences were used in specifically in Perlman's 2006 proof of the Poincaré conjecture. So the single bubble problem here, oh, the constant there in front is just chosen to make the total weighted volume of the space one. A big advantage that this space has over Euclidean space with its crazy infinite volume. So a space in that way already much easier to work with. Now the single bubble problem here is to enclose given weighted volume with minimum weighted perimeter. So the Gaussian weighting applies both to the volume and the perimeter. So we'd like the volume around the origin where the density is big, and we'd like the perimeter to be far away from the origin where the density is small. And moreover, we still have rotational symmetry in the space and in the density. So a sphere about the origin? No, it's not. That is, interestingly enough, that is not the winner. The winner is something simpler than a sphere, than a round sphere. Namely, a flat hyperplane. Well, a hyperplane has finite weighted volume because of the decay of the density as you move away from the origin. It encloses some fraction of the unit volume of the whole space above it. If you want to enclose more area, you just move it down. If you want to enclose less volume, you just move it up. Yeah, the proof of this goes back almost 50 years. And now the question I gave my students is, what is the best double bubble in Gauss space? And it's not two hyperplanes. That's a, that's a good, completely stable conjecture, but you can do better than that if you use three half hyperplanes meeting at 120 degree angles, separating the two bubbles and the complement, the rest of the space. So those into those three, three regions. If you put this, if you put it at the or if you center it at the origin, then both of the, both regions will have volume one third. If you want to change the volumes, you don't change the angles, you just translate this y. If you move it up, for example, then the bottom region would get, would have more weighted volume. And they attempted to prove this using the techniques that were, had worked so well in Euclidean space, especially the case when you know both regions are connected. Um, and they succeeded in proving this double bubble conjecture for nearly equal volumes. So when both bubbles and the complement were very close to a third, for example, in between 0.3 and 0.37, this is where the component bounds imply that each region is connected. So that was good, but that was a dead end for these methods. It was clear that proofs for all volumes would require a completely different approach. And now we wait 15 years. Till last year, the Gaussian double bubble theorem was, an, was uh, announced by Emmanuel Millman of Technion in Israel and Joan Neiman, University of Texas, Austin. For any volumes in any dimensional Gauss space, the best double bubble are these three hyperplanes meeting at 120 degree angles. And I just want to say a word about 
the proof. Here's a bird's eye, a very oversimplified bird's eye view of the proof. So we want to study how the least perimeter, P0, depends on the three volumes. And all we know to start with is that it's less than or equal to the perimeter of our conjecture, which I'll call P sub Y, this red one here. We know how that depends on the three volumes. That's a rather simple shape. The minimizer might be much more intricate, might have many components, curvy. And all we know about to start with is that the blue P0 is less than or equal to the red PY. Or if you graph them, the blue one would lie underneath the red one. It's actually easy to show that they agree at the extreme cases at the endpoints. And then the proposition that they proved is that the curvy one, as the volume, volumes vary, has a more negative second derivative than the flat ones. But in the picture, you see the red one has more negative second derivative than the, than the blue one. And the only way that these can both be true, these statements can both be true, is that they actually have to coincide so that the minimizer is the red, the red Y shape. But they did much more than that. They actually proved not only the best double bubble, but the best K bubble in high dimensional Gauss space. And the solution there is the cone over the regular simplex. So a generalization of that Y shape that we had before now built. So for example, the best triple bubble in three dimensional Gauss space is the cone over the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron has four faces, so this cone divides space into four regions. That's a triple bubble and its complement. If you put the center of the tetrahedron at the origin, each one of those regions will have volume one quarter. And as you move it around, you get all volume possibilities again. And the proof was amazing. It started out by showing that the pieces of this solution have to be flat. So that's a, 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 that's a major step. And the way to do that was to just say, if they're curvy, we can find these variations, these deformations that would improve it and therefore show that it is unstable. And the argument, it was technically very difficult that you to use the latest in what's known in regularity theory to show that the surface doesn't become too wiggly as it approaches the singular, the singular curves, these lines where the flat pieces come together to put the proof through. Uh, you notice the, you need, the, if you have a lot of bubbles, then you need a large dimensional space in order to accommodate the regular simplex. So that for example, for the triple bubble, you have to be at least in R3. The triple bubble in the plane remains an open question today. The conjecture is that this double Y shape, and you can get all possible possibilities for the three areas by moving it around and by uh, lengthening or shrinking that central edge there. But there's a good question for students to work on. That's been around. That was proposed by my students back in 2004. So it's been 20, it's been around almost 20 years and uh, no one's been able to prove that yet. Well, it's time now to move back into Euclidean space and face the triple bubble in Euclidean space because Milman and Neiman realized that the ideas that they got from Gauss space inspired a new approach to Euclidean space. And the big news, the latest news, is that last May, they posted a proof of the triple bubble in R3 and in higher dimensions. Uh, this was, there was, here was a report last October in Quanta by Erica Klareich, a monumental math proof. And monumental, there's a quote from me, but it's a bit out of context, as I'll explain shortly. Solves triple bubble problem and more. And what's meant by and more? Well, they also solve the 
also prove the quadruple bubble, the best quadruple bubble in R4 and above. And the best, and announced that they were going to have uh, an upcoming paper on the best quad quintuple bubble in R5 and above. And moreover, all these results hold in the n-dimensional sphere as well as in Rn. Now the proof was quite amazing. I'm just gonna say a little bit about it. The first step is showing that the surfaces are spherical. Now this is the step that I called monumental because knowing that all the pieces are spherical, for example, would immediately solve the double bubble conjecture. And this is much harder than the Gaussian case where they started out by showing that all the pieces are flat because spherical, well, there's now a whole one parameter family of possible curvatures. And just knowing that the, and, and of course, just knowing that the curvature zero doesn't tell you that the surfaces are spherical. So this, this was a huge, huge step. And it was only after that that they showed the regions connected. You know, back when we were doing the earliest work on the, on the double bubble, the component bounds were, uh, were an early step. Here, it came after showing that the surfaces were spherical. And even then, if you have lots of bubbles, that's a not enough information about how the pieces fit together. You have to know that each uh, region is adjacent to every other region. That they all come together in the conjectured way. Uh, and that can be very hard when you have lots of bubbles around. So that means, for example, that you wouldn't have a, an essentially one-dimensional one chain of bubbles. But as you get higher dimensions, lots of bubbles in higher dimensions, then there are many lower dimensional possibilities and many top dimensional possibilities for the ways that they can fit together. It's hard to, the, the number of possibilities just grows exponentially and makes the six bubble look completely out of reach. So there are, now, the, but there are still some open questions. The quadruple bubble in R3, see, they proved the quadruple bubble in R4 and above. The quadruple bubble in R3 has a nice, here's a, here's a nice picture of it, but the dimension is too small to get reflective symmetry and they need some symmetry to get started. Just as with the double bubble, we needed the rotational symmetry. They get by with less than that, just reflective symmetry, but they do need reflective symmetry. So that leaves that question open. And in fact, the quadruple bubble is also open in the plane. So Paolini and Tortorelli uh, in 2020 proved the equal areas case, which you see on the left here. Um, it looks like all those lines might be straight coming out from, the from that central edge. The central edge is, is straight. The four spokes coming out are slightly bowed, bowed actually, so that E3 and E4 are convex, but E1 and E2 are non-convex. Um, and they had to eliminate, not only study this shape, but eliminate other combinatorial possibilities, such as when one of the regions is at the center, they call that the flower, or in the lower right there, the first region, E1 at the bottom has a second component uh, up on the top called C1. C1. And the latest news on this is that uh, comes from some experimental work doing, being done by a ninth grader who's working with me on this. On this, uh, Marcus Collins is his name, and he's he's found experimentally that the the largest bubbles are always on opposite sides of the central edge, and and mean that you never get straight line, you never get all the spokes being straight in the minimizer. And he, he does these computations on, on Brachy's surface evolver. Uh, these, uh, and uh, here, let me show you. It starts out with something very, very rough, but you'll see when we run the surface evolver, it very quickly improves. And then slowly reaches the optimum. Actually, Marcus is working on a much more general problem, namely uh, bubbles in the plane with density R squared, which unlike the Gaussian density, which decays as you go up to infinity, grows as you go to infinity, uh, starting with a value of zero at the origin. And, and it's quite intriguing there. The op the, here's, 
here in, in with density r squared, the optimal quadruple bubble is much more symmetric. The four bubbles all meet at the origin with four spokes coming out from the origin at equal 90 degree angles, a kind of an unexpected kind of singularity, which is forbidden by the regularity theory when the density is positive. But since the density goes to zero here at the origin, so attractive for these edges, uh, it, uh, this is the first example where we get this singularity of four edges meeting at a point. Here, I'll show you the, the evolution of this. And it's very, it's very delicate because with the density being so small around the origin, it makes it very hard for the evolver to work. But he's got a nice picture here. You see gradually the standard quadruple, the Euclidean quadruple bubble uh, changes to have all four lines meet at the center and achieve this beautiful symmetry. Well, there are more, there's more work all the time, more open questions than ever. The ones I want to leave you with are the quadruple bubble in R3 and the quadruple bubble in R2. So thank you very much.